Hi, my name is Stephen McGee and I'm the author of Toxic Electricity. And we're here to talk about David Blaine and his electrified experiment that he's been doing for the last three days. And he's been firing off sparks from Tesla coils, which are over here, firing off these sparks and they hit him in the head. And he has this little wire cage around his head. You can see the spark coming across from the other Tesla coil that's over here. So there's eight Tesla coils firing sparks at him. So he spent three days being hit by these Tesla coil sparks. And we're going to discuss that cage that's around his head. It's called a Faraday cage. Now uh, Faraday cages, they've been around a long time. They've been around for like 150 years. And uh, they're supposed to protect against electromagnetic radiation exposures. And as you can see, there's a very similar picture showing the cage in the middle with lightning bolts hitting it. And the idea is if you build one of these Faraday cages and stand inside it, that you're completely safe. Well, unfortunately for David Blaine, it's not actually the case. Because electromagnetic radiation is actually made up of electricity, magnetism, and light. And he only seems to be protected somewhat by electricity. And he may not be protected against magnetism. And he's certainly not protected by light. So the, uh, the problems that this brings with it, we're going to demonstrate the uh, problems that these various fields can present to a Faraday cage to clear up any misconceptions about Faraday cages. If you look through my videos, you'll actually see I've done some extensive Faraday cage testing on performance around microwave fields. But we're going to start off with the magnetic field. So this is a standard compass that you would use for navigation when you're hiking as a north and south pole. So we're going to put this on the table. And here's our Faraday cage. So technically it's now shielded from this magnet. And let's see if the magnetic field can affect it. So the thing that I don't think David Blaine understands is that whenever you get a spark, a spark generates a locally generated magnetic field. And locally generated magnetic fields can affect anything in the local area. And no Faraday cage, particularly the one that he has on his head, is going to protect him from that locally generated spark magnetic field that he's getting subjected to. So this effect of our magnetic field going through the wire, which is supposed to protect him, is clearly not true. You know, this, these people are saying that he's protected from electromagnetic radiation exposures. He's certainly not protected from magnetism using that little wire cage that he has on his head. So I'm just going to demonstrate it without it. And it's the same thing. You see that with or without it, the compass needle will spin around when near to a magnetic field. So it's as if the Faraday cage is not there. So the next field I want to show you is the light field. And we're simply going to use a flashlight. So here's our Faraday cage again. Here's our flashlight. We're going to turn it on. And as you can see, the light clearly just passes through the Faraday cage. So he's not protected from light exposures. And one of the unfortunate things about sparks is they tend to give off a lot of ultraviolet radiation emissions. And the kind of distance dependence, so he's got this shield, this Faraday shield around his head, and it's constantly getting hit by sparks. And by association, those sparks will be giving off light emissions. And you can see that because you can see the spark. So there's probably a lot of UV content in those light emissions. And it'll be passing straight through his Faraday cage. So he'll be getting a lot of UV exposure to his head, probably. So uh, again, we take the Faraday cage away. It's the same thing. It just hits the table. So there's really no difference. 
So we covered light, we covered magnetism. So the last thing we've got is electricity. So here is our electrical field generator. Now this is a standard Wi-Fi unit. And this is a RS radiation field detecting unit. So it's actually detecting the field. If we go closer, we can see it increase. So if I put this down here, you can see that we're getting maybe about 2.9 milli, it's actually volts. We're getting 2.9 volts coming out of this unit to the sensor over here. So let's put our Faraday cage in between. So we now have this metal barrier between the two. And this is what it's like without it. This is what it's like with it. So you can see that the Faraday cage is helping a bit, but it doesn't actually kill off the signal. So we're actually 2.9 volts without it, and we're at 1.3 volts with it. So those energy frequencies are passing straight through. And let's just lift the meter up. And you see that? We're still getting a very high reading. So this is what it reads without it. And this is what it reads with the screen. So one of the things, one of the conclusions that I came to when I was developing the research on Faraday cages is that chicken wire is absolutely atrocious as a Faraday cage for microwave radiation. And that's what our little Wi-Fi unit is emitting. It's emitting microwave radiation in the 2.4 gigahertz band. And those sparks that he's getting hit with may well be in the 2.4 gigahertz band and would pass straight through chicken wire. And given that the holes are bigger in his helmet, then his helmet is going to let a lot more wide band frequencies through because the bigger the holes are, the less frequencies of electrical energy it stops. So it's a very standard, well-known theory in antenna and radio engineering. So you, you want a continuous screen whenever you're dealing with radio frequency radiations. That's the, the preference. And if you are going to do screening, Faraday screening, you want your holes to be as small as possible if they're not going to be continuous. So these holes are far too large for microwave radiation. So there we have it. We've tested the three types of energy that he's getting exposed to in his demonstration. And we can clearly see that when it comes to Faraday cages, that they don't actually protect 100% from the exposures. And that's why I did this video. I just want to clear up any misconceptions that people have regarding Faraday cages and electromagnetic radiation protection. Is that Faraday cages protect somewhat against some exposures, but I I don't really know of any Faraday cage that can completely protect against every single electromagnetic radiation exposure. It's going to be interesting to see whether his Faraday cage did actually protect him from radiation exposure. And if he does indeed come down with radio wave sickness from the exposures, then how to recover from radio wave sickness is in this book. Because a few years ago, I actually developed radio wave sickness, and I had to go through the detoxification process to clear up my health back to normal. And the steps that I took to restore my health are documented in this book. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation, and I wish you the very best of health. Thank you.